Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alien Dude, and today I am reviewing this Albion Next Generation Munich and a scabbard made by Zach Suttles of Valiant Armory. Now, this Munich is not mine. It is on loan to me from sword friend Dan, who commissioned the scabbard from Zach, and Zach had it ready at SoCal Sword Fight, and Dan graciously allowed me to pick it up from Valiant Armory, bring it home, hold on to it for a little while and do this review. So thank you to Dan for allowing me to review a sword that I have wanted to get a chance to handle for a long time. The Munich is one of the prettiest Albions th they have in my opinion, and I have long wanted to review one. So I am so glad that I get this opportunity to do so. I should say that this sword is not new from Dan. He bought it secondhand and whoever had it before him might have not quite kept it as oiled as it could have been, as there is out towards the tip, some patina there. So this is not a new sword. So when you see some flaws in the finish and that kind of thing, be aware that's not how it would have come from Albion. Now this sword is, aside from being one of Albion's prettiest swords, is also, I believe, their most expensive next generation model. In this specific configuration with the wire wrap and the gothic uh, leather wrap, this sword would set you back $2,784. You don't need me to tell you that that is a lot of money. To put that into some context, that's just a little, it's right around $400 less than I paid for one of the crown jewels of my collection, the Golden Dream by Damien Solovsky, which came with a gorgeous scabbard as well. So there's a lot of money invested in this specific sword and that means it has more to live up to during this review. This is an Oakshot Type 18B sword which was a very late medieval and into early renaissance sword that was generally speaking had a quite long blade, long hilt, and was oftentimes very focused on thrusting. So we have here the museum page for this sword. Now this is in the Munich Museum in Germany. I am not going to be able to pronounce this, so I'm not even going to try to do so. And looking at this sword, I have this page translated from German to English, by the way. And you can see that this sword is incredibly well preserved, first off. There's pretty much, from what I'm seeing, no corrosion anywhere, just utterly gorgeous condition and also incredibly ornate. Look at how much detail there is in the leather work. It's plated in gold in parts on the cross guard. There's, it looks like the coin insert in there might also be plated in gold. It is just a sublime sword and one of the prettiest ones in, in a museum, in my opinion. We can look here, There's there is a rain guard, rain shape, there's a bunch of ideas of what to call these, and I don't think anybody has come up with an actual definitive term. There is one of those on here. It is not replicated on the Albion. The You can see that there is a hexagonal cross section right here, just like on the Albion. There's some kind of maker's mark or inlay right here that is not on the Albion. But overall, the the profile is absolutely nailed. It... it is so clearly inspired by this sword and just a lesser degree of decoration. I imagine if Albion were to duplicate all of this, it would double the price at least. And this is already one of the most expensive Albion sword in their next generation line. So they could do it as a museum line if they really wanted to, but I think it would be a very hard sell. So Dan had Zach Suttles of Valiant Armory make this scabbard for this sword. And I believe the budget was $1,000, but the actual price was $900. And holy crap, did Zach knock this scabbard out of the park. The way he mirrored the grip here in this section, along with this beautiful uh, kind of matted blue, Oh, it's so pretty. It is so well done. It may not be the most historical design, but god damn, does this look good. I absolutely love the scabbard. 
the, the looks. I reviewed one of Zach's scabbards fairly recently in the Albion Wallace, and I think I said in that review that that scabbard was the favorite, my favorite that I'd seen Zach do. Well, <laughs> this one now takes that crown. This is just absolutely gorgeous. And if we look, there's absolutely no rattle. The fit is just sublime. And hold it upside down, shake, doesn't come out. But then when you pull it, it does, it is a little snug. It could be very slightly easier to pull out, but it's still such a smooth draw. And a lot of that is because there is a felt lining on the inside of the core. And that brings up something I want to point out. Now in the Wallace review, I mentioned that when you're inserting a sword into a felt lined scabbard, you have to be really careful to get the angle of the sword correct or the tip can bite into the felt, pull it off the wood and end up ruining your scabbard. Well, on this one, that's still the case, but because the Munich is such a thick sword, the gap or the opening in the scabbard at the mouth is a lot bigger and therefore it's really easy to get this sword in here without worrying about hitting the felt. I can do it, I won't say I can do it without looking because I'm not going to do that because this is not my sword and scabbard. I do not want to mess up this scabbard. It is just entirely too gorgeous. But it is definitely noticeably easier for me to sheathe this sword than the Wallace was because it is so much thicker and that mouth is so much wider. Looking at the hilt, let's start with the pommel. This is a type J pommel with a recess in the center boss here. Now, this is one of the least dimensional pommels I've seen on the Albion. And what I mean by that is that while the center ridge here, the center portion, does start a tiny bit thicker here and narrow just a little bit towards the peen, it's very, very minor. There's not really much uh, geometry there. I'm not going to criticize that because since this sword is very closely based on the famous one in the Munich Museum, hence the name the Munich, this is probably what that pommel was like in the museum. I don't have a way of knowing that, but that's just my hunch. Now the finish on here is going to be pretty typical for an Albion wheel pommel, maybe a little bit less grind lines than I will normally see. And there are coins inserted into the recess and they are not antiques. And unfortunately, they aren't even replicas of antique coins. These are modern made and very obviously so, as you see, 1980 stamped on them. I would prefer something that looks more historical. If it's going to be a coin, there are quite a few antique coins available. Or you can go for something like DBK's pommel markers. Either of those would look a lot better than very obviously modern made coins in my opinion. If we look at the peen, it's got a really cool floral design worked into the peen block here. Really nicely done. And as always for Albion, the peen is very, very clean, very smoothly done, just very nice looking. Now the corners of this, again, as always for Albion, are smoothed over very, very nicely. There's no hot spots here. And with this long of a grip, the pommel's not really going to get in the way and bite into the hand unless you're trying to grip way down here. Personally, I would much rather grip with my offhand more along here. So I know a lot of people dislike wheel pommels because they can bite into the hand. Well, on the Munich, I don't think that's a problem. The grip on this sword is long. But again, it is based on a historic sword that had a long grip like this. This is the Gothic configuration of the Munich that Albion offers with the half wire wrap. The Gothic is this X pattern and these dotted uh, little studs in here. That's what the Gothic look is. Now, this wire wrap is so well done. It is perfectly tight. It Wire can sometimes be a little rough on the hands, I've found, 
not the case on this one. It is very, very comfortable to use. And I will say this stud right here sometimes does bite into my hand just a touch when using the sword. Not a lot, and if I wear gloves, it doesn't bother me at all, but it is something I noticed. The overall shape has a lot of dimension to it. It's wider than it is thick, and there's not a ton of taper to it in this upper part, but then once it gets down in here, it kind of does the wasting into fully cylindrical up here towards the pommel. The color of the leather wrap here is a dark brown, and as always with Albion, the transitions to the cross guard and the pommel are just perfect. There's absolutely nothing that could really be improved about that. And if I try to twist the grip in my hand to see if I have a good grip or not, I'm going to, as Matthew Jensen describes it, white knuckle the grip. I do have just a little bit of wiggle here, but not very much. And that's with me really pushing on this guard pretty hard. And as somebody commented in a, my video where I did this in my last video, the longer the cross guard, the more leverage there is to twist it. So this is a relatively long cross guard, so I am able to put more torque into uh, twisting it. That probably explains why I can twist it just a little bit. The cross guard on here would be considered a type 12, which has an S shape to the guard. It's going to be hard to show that there, but hopefully you can see it there. And it is nowhere near as dramatic of a S shape as on the graphic I'll put up here of what a typical type 12, I mean, I hate to use that word, not even typical. The illustration I have that shows what a type 12 cross guard is like, this is a much subtler S shape than that one. The finish on here is quite clean. Uh, there's still some grind lines visible as pretty much always on a Albion cross guard, but it's nicely cleaned up. There's a couple decorative grooves cut in right here. Personally, I would like to see them continue around the cross guard, but very minor detail there. The corners are all chamfered very nicely, again, as you would expect, and you could finger the guard at pretty comfortably, except that the blade is thin enough here that it's not going to feel comfortable on my hand. And if we look at the gap in the cross guard, there is pretty much no way this could be better. It is fit to the blade as well as you could possibly fit it. Now this type of blade, which is not quite uh, a flattened diamond here towards the cross guard, it's actually hexagonal, but there's no full or anything like that. This type of blade is going to be easier to fit to the gap in the cross guard because you don't have the fuller, but it's still just incredibly well done and a really a, a hallmark of Albion is how well they do the cross guard fit. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So this sword is pretty narrow and doesn't have a ton of profile taper. It's pretty even and ge gentle throughout the majority of the blade and then out towards the tip, it starts narrowing a bit more into a pretty aggressively acute point. It is a thick sword starting at 8.3 millimeters thick and tapering down not quite 50% distal taper. It ends around four and a half millimeters. That is a thick point, which means it is going to be a good durable point for thrusting into harder targets. But because it is that thick and not particularly wide, it is less cut focused than it could be if it were wider and thinner. That doesn't mean it can't cut, just that it is by design going to be a little bit more focused on the thrust than cut, but we'll get into how it performs later. So one of the really cool things I like about the Munich is the unique geometry at the base of the sword. It has actually got a small hexagonal section that lasts for the first nine inches or so of the blade, gently narrowing down. That's not something you see on a lot of swords, but it is something that I really like to see because it gives the sword more character. What it also does is make the blade, it adds weight back here on the blade, which helps balance out the point 
of the further out blade, you know, a very long blade and relatively thick out here. So there needs to be a good amount of weight back here to help balance that out. And having that hexagonal cross section there does add a bit more weight to it. That hexagonal cross section also terminates, you know, it gently thins until it eventually transitions into the center ridge of the sword. And as far as I can see, that's at the same point on both sides of the blade. You want that to be symmetrical if you can. Now on the historical one, since medieval people were not nearly as concerned with symmetry as modern people, maybe it wasn't. I don't have any way of knowing. I do not have access to the original. But with the way it transitions into that center ridge, it's a really beautiful and subtle detail on this sword. And looking at that center ridge, it is perfectly straight, perfectly smooth throughout the entire blade and on both sides, right down the center of the sword, perfectly done. If we look at the finish of the sword, it is very typical for Albion with a nice satin with some grind lines still visible, but not uh, highly visible. And there's no rippling at all if you look down the surfaces of the blade. The uh, beveling here is very, very good. One smooth bevel to the edge. And there is a, you can see the apple seeded geometry where the edge is a slightly different polish than the rest of the sword. It's not a true micro bevel or secondary bevel. It is apple seeded over nicely. Now I would like to see the edge given just a little bit more attention, a little bit more of a polish. It would be nice to see it blend in with the rest of the polish or even be a higher polish than the rest of the sword because there are a few spots where I can see it being, a, it, where it's a little rougher than I think it should be. That is kind of normal from what I see of an Albion. Personally, I think Albion should try to get that a little bit more refined of a polish on the edge. And that's just going to help improve the overall cutting ability of the sword and also just make it look a little bit better. I'm going to test the edges on some printer paper here. And again, this is not a brand new sword. So this is not the edge as it would necessarily come from Albion. It might be, I don't know how much it's been used. Looking at it, it doesn't look to me like it's been resharpened, but for all I know, it's been swung against wood and stuff and therefore may have dulled a little bit. I don't really know the history, so I'm not judging the edge that Albion puts on it. What I'm doing here is trying to provide context to the cutting footage because the sharpness determines, is a big part of how well it cuts. All right, so completely failed to bite into the paper there. That time it did bite in, but it wasn't a super clean cut. It was definitely, uh, it was kind of dragging through the paper. It wasn't tearing so much as not being a particularly smooth cut. Yeah, so when it does bite in, it's not a particularly smooth cut, but it is sharp enough to cut the paper. And now with the other edge, failed to start the cut there. Same there. Yeah, this edge feels like it might be a little bit duller. So it's completely failing to bite in. That's insert the sword. Okay, so you can even see that there. You see how it's kind of moving back and forth? That's partially because it's a long sword and doing this, it's kind of an awkward motion. So the sword's moving a little bit, but it's also not slicing cleanly through. It's doing a lot more, not tearing, but not doing super clean slices. And yeah, this, this edge is getting closer to tearing than it is cutting. So one edge is definitely a little bit less sharp than the other. When it comes to cutting with this sword, my first thought was that it was not going to be a very effective cutter because it is thick out here and pretty narrow, just not really a sword that you'd think would 
be a good cutter. Now, all, all I cut with the sword was water bottles, and it cut them much better than I expected it to do so. At first, I thought it was going to not really bash, but not give me a lot of clean cuts and easy cuts, and I thought it was going to be difficult to accelerate the tip, but it wasn't. This sword, and, oh, let me correct that. When I first started using it and moving it around, I did struggle accelerating the tip a little bit, but then I kind of got a feel for the sword. And once I did that, this sword cuts, light targets at least, very, very well. It can cut through them with very little effort. Part of that's going to be because lighter targets generally don't need a really good cutter to be able to cut them well. And also the rigidity of this sword does help cut lighter targets because when you're cutting them, if your edge alignment's off or not quite right, a rig more rigid sword can help power through lighter targets. Whereas a uh, floppier sword, not really the right word, a more flexible sword, generally speaking an earlier medieval sword, it's going to be able to cut very well if you are not, if, you're, if your edge alignment is on and your technique is on, but it doesn't do you many favors. More rigid swords on light targets, I do find it does you a lot of favors by being able to power through the cuts. That said, when a sword does that on light targets like water bottles, you will see it in the target in that it'll be crunched up, the it'll be more tearing than cutting, and that wasn't the case with this sword. This sword produced very clean cuts, very fun cuts, and it surprised me in that, honestly. I didn't do a ton of thrusting with this sword. I did do a little bit, and you know, with, with its very acute point and thick point, it's going to be a very effective thruster, and it is very easy to put the tip where I want it to be. So when you first look at this sword with its narrow profile, very acute point, and just the overall look and feel of it, you would think thrust focused, right? At least that's what I think when I first see this sword. And it definitely has a good amount of focus on the thrust. You know, the tip is very agile, can be moved, the tip can be placed where you want it very, very easily. but it has more authority in the cut and more balance towards the cut than I ever expected it to have. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, it while yes, it is generally speaking a narrow blade, it doesn't have a lot of profile taper. So it still remains a decent width out here. There's a lot of weight back here. It starts very thick, has a hexagonal cross section here, and then just a, a really large hilt that adds more weight back here. And just overall, the way it does that and still maintains a lot of thickness out here, it ends up having more weight out here and more blade presence than I would have expected just looking at the sword. You know, it's balanced around four inches, if I remember right. And I would think that for me personally, a very thrust focused sword is going to be balanced more closer to the cross guard, more like around one and a half, two, two and a half inches like that. So this is balanced more like a cut and thrust balance sword, which it actually turns out to be. And when using this sword to do, to practice my, my technique, I was shocked at how loud it is at producing sword wind. I am positive the microphone picked that up because it is a very loud sword. It is very easy to get sword wind out of it, which in some ways makes it a good training tool because it's easy to know that your edge alignment is on. But if it's too easy to generate sword wind, it, it can kind of be a little deceptive about how your technique is doing. So there's kind of a give and take there. Now, with this sword being so thick throughout, without a ton of distal taper. It has a, a good amount of distal taper, but it still stays pretty thick out there. It is a very rigid blade. I can barely flex it much at all. And I want to compare that to another Type 18B 
that I reviewed oh, several months ago, I don't remember exactly, one of the worst swords I ever reviewed, the Dark Sword Armory Gothic Longsword. Take a look, I'm going to freeze frame them here, take a look at the difference in flex. That is a dramatic difference. That This Munich is one of the stiffest blades I have reviewed. And that is one of the reasons it's, all, it's going to be a very good thruster, but also a reason it's going to be a little more forgiving in the cut because a stiff blade, if your edge alignment's off a little bit, uh, a more flexible blade will either bounce off the target or wiggle around in the target and just end up not doing a clean cut. Whereas a rigid blade can just kind of power through the target and still deliver a good amount of a cut. Now, a couple interesting things about the hilt here. Because it is so long, it gives you a variety of options of where you, how you want to grip it. You know, you can bunch your hands together here, or you can start lowering your offhand to get more leverage in the cut and drive the sword more with the lower hand. It's, a lot of it is your preference and how you like to hold the sword. Another thing you can do is, if I'm going to start a cut, and then switch to a thrust, I can really extend the reach by using my offhand to extend the cut or extend the stab. So that just gives you more options with this sword. And surprisingly to me, this sword is still usable one-handed. To me, it's not particularly nimble one-handed, but it is usable, especially for thrusts. For cuts, it does start to feel a little cumbersome in my hands, but it's not terrible. The last thing about this model is this little stud right here. This bites into my hand somewhat if I'm barehanded when I'm using this sword. When I was wearing gloves and cutting, no problem at all. But when I'm just dry handling it without gloves, I do notice this kind of rubs against my hand a little uncomfortably. Not a lot, but if I were doing a lot of practice swings with this, I would either want to wear a glove or not have this gothic configuration because this, this does get a little onerous to me. And for a comparison to this Munich, I have here the Cold Steel Hand and a Half Sword. Now, this is a sword that costs about a tenth of what this Munich would cost. But I'm not talking about fit and finish and accuracy, historical accuracy and stuff. I want to talk about how they feel in the hand. And I chose the Cold Steel because it has a very long grip and it's balanced at the, around the same point. They're around a half inch difference in the point of balance. And the overall weight is pretty similar too at about one, one to two ounces difference. So if we look here, obviously the Munich is considerably longer of a blade, but overall the hilt proportions are somewhat similar. The cold steel off obviously has a much uh, wider blade throughout. So when I'm pick up the cold steel and move it around. And you can hear it has some sword wind too. It is not nearly as loud as the Munich, but it does create sword wind. And it has a decent amount of maneuverability too. It actually feels pretty similar to the Munich. I was surprised at that. I was like, I was expecting when I picked this sword to review it, I'd be like, so these specs are pretty similar, right? Well, they couldn't possibly be further from how they feel, but no, they actually feel relatively similar. The cold steel does feel a little more blade presence out this way, a little more tip weight than the Munich does, but really they feel remarkably similar. I would say, let's see. Honestly, I think the cold steel handles in one hand a little bit better. It's actually getting better sword wind one-handed than I was too with it. And the tip, let's see. Tip is a little bit less maneuverable, that's for sure, but not terribly so. This is still a pretty maneuverable sword and it is almost as rigid as the Munich. So when I picked this up right after holding the cold steel and moving it around, this one definitely feels a little faster. As soon as I pick it up, I notice it's easier to accelerate the tip. It's easier to just get it out there. 
the tip itself is definitely a little more maneuverable. So this is definitely, in my opinion, a somewhat better handling sword for, you know, 10 times the price. That's kind of to be expected. But honestly, they feel remarkably similar. And that can tell you if you can't afford a Munich, the Cold Steel, it's not going to get you a Munich. It's not going to get you even remotely close to a Munich in terms of overall package. But in terms of handling, it's not too dissimilar. The Munich is certainly longer, a little more graceful, a little bit more power, or a little bit faster, and just overall, a, obviously, a better sword. But the Cold Steel's not a bad option. Bottom line, this sword would set you back $2,784 from Albion, and the scabbard was $900 from Valiant Armory. What do you get for that price? Well, I'm going to start with the scabbard. You get a scabbard that is gorgeous. This is one of the prettiest scabbards I've seen in, from Zach, period. And it, the fit is sublime. It is beautifully fit to the sword. This scabbard is gorgeous and I love it. My only niggling complaint about it, I forgot to mention this earlier, is that I don't really like the buckles they use on the scabbards and the leather they use on their belts feels a little cheaper to me than the leather they use on the rest of the scabbard. But even with those very minor complaints, this scabbard is absolutely worth the price. I love the scabbard and I'm going to need to commission Zach to make a scabbard for something for me at some point in the future. Now, the Munich, what do you get for that almost $2,800? You get a sword that is a very nice in sword that is inspired by the historical sword. Definitely not a direct replica, especially if you look at the decorative nature of the hilt, but a sword that is uh, inspired by one of the most iconic historical swords that we we as sword aficionados drool over, frankly. And a sword that is very thrust-focused while still being surprisingly effective in the cut. A sword that is, what, despite having a massive hilt, frankly, is still surprisingly usable in one hand and that absolutely sings in two hands. It is a ton of fun to move this sword around. It screams to me German longsword and all the techniques that you think of for German longswords, this sword feels to me like it is designed specifically for those, which I can imagine it probably was, but is it worth almost $2,800? That's a tough ask. I love the Munich. This is a gorgeous sword. It's a ton of fun to handle. I don't know if I $2,800 love it. That is, like I mentioned earlier, you can get a sword and scabbard from some very well-respected makers for that price. And here you're paying just $2,800 for the sword. Now, admittedly, if you took off the wire wrap and the Gothic configuration, that does drop the price of the Munich down, I believe around three to $400. I don't have it up in front of me right now, but I'll put it up on screen. I love this sword. I would love to own one of these. I don't think I would pay this price for this sword, even though it is such a good sword. It is it's, it speaks to me in a way that a lot of swords do and that I love the late medieval, early Renaissance long swords. They're, they are my favorite swords and the Munich is, exemplifies that style of sword. But $2,800 is a lot to ask. And while I do really enjoy it, it does cut pretty damn well for a blade that is this narrow. At the same time, I do like my swords to be effective cutters. And this sword may not be the best, for instance, tatami cutter. Now, I didn't do tatami cutting, but it's going to struggle with that. Now, that's not to say it can't cut tatami. I'm sure, like for instance, Philip Martin would be able to cut tatami no problem with this sword. But it's definitely not going to be uh, designed for that kind of cutting. And the more I get into it, the more I kind of want my swords to be able to do that. So I'm not sure that I consider this sword for my collection worth $2,800. At the same time, 
I can't say it's not worth that. This is a phenomenal sword that I really like. And if that is what you want and you value it, that that's perfectly fine. And I get it. I totally get it. It is worth that price if that's what you want. I just, even though I love the Munich, I don't think I want it for $2,800. But if we take off the Gothic configuration and the wire wrap and the sword gets down to $1,900, I might just like it $1,900. So that's something I'm going to have to think about whether or not I would want to pay $1,900 to add a Munich to my collection. I'm not sure, but it's certainly more attractive of a price at that price point, in my opinion. And that's going to wrap up this review. I want to give a huge thank you to sword friend Dan for loaning me this sword to review. It gave me a chance to review a sword that I have many times considered buying from Albion. And I think that it's going to save me the money of doing that because while I do love it, just not quite enough for that price. Thank you, Dan, for loaning me this sword. For everybody else, do all those YouTube things. Like, subscribe, hit the, uh, leave a comment, share the video wherever you want. Do all the things that YouTube wants you to do to help this channel continue to grow. Until next time, Alien Tude out.